Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, tonight, um, I'm here to introduce Sarah Manning um, from Space Agency. Um, I'll tell you maybe a little bit about Sarah, and then a bit about how I know Sarah, and a bit about Space Agency. Um, so Sarah's originally from San Francisco. Uh, she studied here at the AA and graduated with a master's in, um, is that correct, architecture and urbanism from the DRL in 2002. Um, if I get anything wrong, you can just correct me afterwards, but I think that hopefully it's all right. Um, and before setting up her practice in 2008, um, she was an associate director at Space Syntax, who's an international design consultancy based in London. Um, I came to know Sarah in, I believe it was 2010. Um, we were, I was working at Zaha Deed's office, and um, we were working on a large-scale master plan. It was about a million square meters. And the complexity of the wayfinding and signage was um, something I had never really experienced before. And it was an absolute pleasure working with Sarah on this project. Um, because her way of dealing with the user experience inside of a complex spatial organization um, it was a mixed-use space, which was, um, it had about 3,000 cars of parking, 18 office towers, a hotel, and uh, retail. Um, so you can imagine it was very complex. Um, and Sarah was a fantastic member of the team, and who taught me a lot about user experience in the environment. So it was really a fantastic uh, experience for myself. Um, in addition to practicing, um, Sarah is also a trustee for a charity um, for, called Architecture for Humanity here in the UK. Um, and she's worked there to establish a humanitarian lecture series. Um, she's, also taught, um, she's also taught courses at the Bartlett, the Welsh School of Architecture, and the University of East London. Um, so I'll let Sarah tell you a bit about what they do as an office. Um, it's much better coming from her than it is from me. But one of the things that I really felt about Sarah coming here and giving this lecture is I think for students to be able to see the alternative forms of practice that come out of the architectural studies. Um, I think that's something that we're always encouraging our students to look at, to understand that being an architect today can have a lot of variety in that. Um, so thank you very much. And please give a warm welcome to Sarah. And we'll open up for questions afterwards. Okay, well, thank you very much, Diane. That was very, very kind. Um, yes, so, and also thank you to the AA for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, I studied here from 2000 to 2002 in the DRL. Um, and since that time, I think my career has gone uh, kind of on a trajectory from architecture. So I thought it would be interesting to return and um, open up a sort of um, unconventional path for students. Um, a lot of what we do in the office is kind of pushing the boundaries of what architecture is. And um, you'll see a bit more of that. Um, I've organized the lecture into three parts. So there is a first part, which is um, a, situating our practice in contemporary um, kind of societal shifts. Second is, because this is part of the What's Next series, to give you a little bit of background about what I did here and how it led me to start Space Agency. And then finally, I'll show you some work from our practice. So, um, as we all know, we, the, our, the practice of architecture has changed um, quite a bit, um, and the, our working practices have changed quite a bit, and um, I believe what's now called the third industrial revolution, the, the automation and digitization of our work, um, has affected us all. Um, so, it's affected many realms. In terms of, if we, if we look here, if we just start thinking of different um, realms in which, where we can look at the relevance of space. Um, this is uh, an imperial forum in Rome where you had the um, seat of politics and religion and economy 
spatialized in the center of the city. Um, if you fast forward, you know, thousands of years, you can see that even in the 19 mid century, this is the United Nations General Assembly, um, politics was still conducted very much um, in physical space and the, the form, the circular form of the space mattered quite a bit. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing through our technology, really, we're seeing a complete change in the in house, the relevance of space. So um, as we know, we have individual actors who are, who are acting as reporters, who are redistributing culture across, um, across the internet, um, and we have a flattening of space. So the political space now is very much conducted in a, in a flattened 2D space. If we think about communication, same thing. This is the Pony Express. News was distributed um, through roads through route, so news was carried. This is um, prior to the telegraph in the United States. News was carried across the United States on horseback. Um, in the mid-century when television came in, news was, was um, broadcast. Common news was, was broadcast into people's living rooms, um, and it was kind of despatialized onto television sets. Um, but people watched the same thing. So even when I was little, I remember you would talk to people the next day about something you watched on television. They also watched the exact same thing. So essentially, there was still a shared space, space of communication, but your house wasn't, the walls of your house weren't actually separating that space of communication. Now we have a much more flattened space of communication. So here on Skype, you, you're actually on the same 2D plane as, as the person you're talking to. Um, and even when you're in physical space, you may be kind of absorbed into your screen. So that actually, although this is the space for chance encounter um, and for, um, let's say, uh, political action, very much we're we've sort of flattened out our space and, and at the same time we're, we're communicating with people through this virtual space um, all over. Space of exchange, um, this is New York City, Times Square. Cities were formed around exchange, exchange of goods, exchange of information, um, very much about the marketplace and um, certainly exchange was spatialized this is the uh, National Science Foundation net, NSF net, which grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, and now forms one of, it's, uh, one of the main backbones of the internet. So this is the actual configuration of the space of a lot of our exchanges, but it's invisible to us and we don't know its configuration. Um, and what we see is something that's quite 2D. Um, so it's sort of flattened out the consumer interface. Um, and then what we have is we have elements of architecture like walls, firewalls, actually being reinserted into our understanding of what happens in that virtual space. Um, so, so we understand a wall, and therefore we understand what a firewall is. Um, but it's, it's essentially a, a metaphor for us to understand the spaces we're interacting in. And, and we actually think, or I think that virtual space isn't so much about a recreation or a visualization of 3D space inside um, a computer, but it's actually all the exchange and interaction we have in, inside digital space. So again, a, a metaphor um, and I was really fascinated when I was younger by this metaphor of the, the graphic user interface being a desktop. The idea that once we understood, because I remember computers before the desktop, and it was very hard to navigate around. It was very um, uh, dehumanizing. But once there was, there, were, well, there was a file system, and you could navigate through file folders, which you recognize as being file folders, and you could throw things into a trash, which you recognize as being under your desk, it humanized it um, and framed it in familiar terms. So I actually 
um, where this connects with what I was doing at the DRL, I actually think that there were kind of two potential paths as, as technology advanced and we were digitizing. One which has happened to quite an extent where the internet started moving into devices such as computers and then smaller devices, the mobile phone, smartphone. Um, at the same time, it could have and has to a certain extent um, been absorbed into architecture and into urban space. Um, so I think that product designers really jumped in and embedded the internet into mobile devices, and I don't think to the same extent the architectural profession jumped in and um, absorbed connectivity into urban space. Um, of course, the difference is that products can be privately owned, they can be privately developed and sold, um, and you have exclusive then use of information, whereas in the environment, um, often that, often the environment, if, especially if it's in a city, is part of the public domain, um, and it's common. So certainly you have a profit um, motive to develop connectivity in space um, through devices, through smaller and smaller devices, whereas um, if that same connectivity were embedded into the urban environment, often it would need to be publicly funded, there would be multiple stakeholders, the ownership of the information becomes more complex. Um, so certainly, as a timeline, we've been looking at this, we all know, we've been looking at an accelerating pace of uh, development of devices which allow us to extend our intelligence and our um, reading of the environment. Um, but those devices not only sense the environment for us or extend our senses, they also filter the environment in certain ways, some of which we sometimes don't think that much about. So, this is a diagram showing a study in 2014 of how comfortable people are um, with wearable, wearable internet, wearable and even embedded devices. You see this 29% um, of people would be comfortable with internet devices clipped onto their clothing, um, 28 with it strapped onto their wrist, and then as you start going further and further into the, their body, like embedded into clothing, embedded into jewelry, headphones, glasses, upper arm, contact lenses, tattooed, comfort levels decrease in 2014. But actually what's happening is that we're becoming more and more accustomed to carrying this connectivity in our hand and being focused on it, and people are becoming it's, it's all a matter of becoming accustomed to new technologies. So um, where is it leading? I actually think that where mobile technology is leading is um, into our bodies. Um, and by contrast, if mobile, if connectivity to the internet, let's say, as a general word, were embedded into the environment, we, it would be different because it might not be as private, it might be more public. And this isn't an, I don't mean to make a kind of dichotomy here, it's not either or, I'm sure it will be both. Um, so many of you I'm sure have heard of the fourth industrial revolution. This is a new term that's been coined and used by World Economic Forum, the people in Davos. Um, which talks about the convergence of physical, digital, and biological worlds. Um, so this, if we look at sort of um, digital and biological, we have the cyber, uh, the kind of cyborg phenomenon. If you look at the digital and physical, you have something more embedded into the environment. Um, so I think that increasingly we are gonna expect a level of information a layer of information between us and the environment because we've come to expect connectivity. Um, and part of this fourth, fourth industrial revolution is 
it's moving back out from the flattened space of the screen that we're all kind of so glued to these days, um, mapping that back on to the real and the actual. And that's what a lot of people feel is really the next step. And it's a huge, for industry, the tech industry, this is where everything's happening. So everybody's talking about location-based services and tracking people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it can be in a device, but it can also be in the public realm, and it can also be um, something that is for common benefit. So um, going back to where I started, I actually i am from San Francisco, as Tyann mentioned. I started in, I got out of college during the dot-com boom, and I started in um, user interface and 3D user interfaces. So I worked on a number of projects that were very early stage, 1990s um, user interface projects where I worked on an encyclopedia inside a 3D museum, and I worked on um, kind of virtual tours of cruise ships and buildings. Um, and actually, I've included this one here because this was for Donald Trump. <laughs> it is bronze, just so you know. Um, this is Trump World Tower, and it's next to you, uh, the United Nations on the East River in New York. And this guy needed to see that building in so many different shades of gold and bronze, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so I had enough of him already then. Um, but what, what I got out of this experience, it, if I had stayed in that, I would be in Silicon Valley, I'd be working in tech. I started there and I really, really felt that everything I was doing was almost like a video game. It was for a screen and I really wanted to be involved in, I wanted to get back to designing things that were for the real world and had other senses involved, had tactility, had materiality, had, you know, all the things that we appreciate in embodied experience. Um, so I came to the AA. And I started at the DRL, um, and this is the last time that I was standing here. Uh, it's a long time ago, and I'm very happy to have one of my teammates here tonight. Um, and we, uh, so our uh, brief was, was responsive environment. So it was how can the, um, how can architecture respond to user requirements, and how can it actually be somehow animated by, by people's needs. Um, and our, my project with my group, we were in a group of five, um, our brief was to develop a residential, some sort of residential development in London. And we worked on a network, which we called Network Living. Um, so this is, I started in 2000. And I'll just show you a little bit of that. It's very old school. But um, but uh, I think had some interesting aspects to it. Yeah, so. So yeah. Um, so the idea behind this project, we were, we looked at changes to work particularly work practices, even though our brief was a residential brief. We were interested in work, uh, live work scenarios. And um, we looked at, we, we focused on the mobile knowledge worker, which, which would be self-employed um, people who could work outside of their central office. And we looked at the changes of the kind of fragmentation of the unity of the home. So maybe 30, 40 years earlier, you would have seen a lot of people working in a central business district, living in a, in a kind of monofunctional suburb and um, socializing in a third space somewhere in between. And we saw that this was actually kind of fragmenting and exploding into the city and people were mixing their day quite a bit more. Um, so we define these three spheres of dwelling, working, and lounging, which is socializing, and activities involved in, in each of those, um, which, do, which require more or less privacy. Um, and we looked at this aspect that 
with the global movement of people, capital, and information, you have a kind of um, de-territorializing of people from their locale into, so more and more people are leaving their, their kind of um, geographic base and their, their clan connections and moving out into the world. Um, and, but at the same time, what we noticed is that even though people wanted to get away from the central office, when people when a lot of people would report when they worked at home, there was a sense of isolation and um, lack of community. And so there was this idea, our idea at the time 15 years ago was collective teleworking would be a, um, a kind of antidote to that. So, uh, we looked at a simulation, um, and essentially what we developed is a network, a kind of um, superimposed network of buildings, which were, um, or a superimposed um, collection of networks. So it was buildings over a transport network. So there were, we initially developed four buildings in London, um, which are all one connection away on the London Underground from each other. Um, it was an intranet, so I think definitely mobile phones didn't exist at this time, or, or smartphones didn't exist at this time, so you didn't have connectivity to the internet on your phone. Um, so the idea was that you would put in, you'd buy into this network and you'd put in your shared media files, so your work, your work applications, your music, your movies, your um, email settings, your web bookmarks. So it's pretty old school, but it was essentially all of your customization preferences. Um, and so it was a technological network, it was a building network, it was a social network, because you're part of a group with these other people in the buildings, and it was a, um, a professional network as well. It's a co-working network. And it's pay as you stay. So there are four buildings, you are a resident of all of them and your thumbprint um, gets you in, your um, digital imprint gets you into all the spaces, um, and you pay for the time you use. We, of course, had to designate that everyone would have one kind of core dwelling, um, but that what we realized was this whole kind of zoning, urban zoning of suburban versus central business district was a model of the past and that actually there's so much unused space and you have cities that are so dead on weekends and evenings and you have um, suburban areas which are so kind of dead during the day um, and that actually there was a lot of unused building space in there and actually if we could capitalize on that we could we could kind of condense the activities with the possibility that people could move and reconfigure use different types of spaces during the day so it wasn't so typologically driven, but that space could be more reconfigurable. Um, so the aspect of time became a major, um, a major kind of driver in the, um, in the project. The idea that you're mostly sleeping at night, most people are mostly working during the day, and if we could optimize and make this network more efficient and, and be reused for different activities, we could actually reduce the amount of space that people would be using. So, so where that went is we developed a grid, um, which we called the elastic grid. This was on the idea that the, the building actually needed to be responsive we took these nodal points within the grid and started looking, and we used scripting, we started looking at how the, the grid itself might actually change depending on use. Um, we moved from a kind of cubic grid to a couple of slabs that were, had its structural connection points, and, um, and then started exploring how a building might actually move and reconfigure to, um, to, to suit activity and movement of people, different people. Um, we moved away from the idea that the building would move. There were a lot of issues with that. Um, 
but it was fun to explore it. And um, uh, we, we came back to an idea that you would have these core dwellings. Um, we took, we used the, the kind of um, layout of the elastic grid to choose four floor plates that had a minimum area, that's your kind of minimum space for use. Um, we then took each of those four and, multi and, and tried a combination of each one. So we made a matrix of different typologies. And um, the thing, and then we chose four units, four models that people could choose from for their core dwelling. Um, and the thing about these models, these four units, is that they can, the important thing is that they configured in different ways. So you could either choose a minimum space that would connect with the kitchen, so you could have a flat chair type of arrangement, you could have a single one, or you could connect the bedroom, so you could have a kind of do a couple type of situation. Um, and then, uh, then those were aggregated on a larger scale. So we had three, um, I think, three different ways that these would configure, particle, linear, or weave, and those had different social implications. So the particle had more of a kind of detached house um, type of arrangement, et cetera. Um, we then looked at the space around the dwelling core, which was a reconfigurable open field of activities. Um, and that would be used for both working and lounging. And that's where the pay as you stay came into play, which was that the idea is you load all your media onto this intranet, um, which is part of your social network, your professional network. And then you, um, when you use a space and use your digital imprint, it can fit, that space can fit, so this is the responsive part, it configures to your, um, your preferences. So your work downloads, your music downloads, your movies download. And what that means is because there are multiple buildings, today maybe you meet somebody in Notting Hill, you meet a couple of friends, you watch a movie together, you rent that space, but that space configures to your settings. Um, and then later in the day, you, need, you have a work meeting and you need to be in the city and you go to the building there and you download your work and you meet with a client. Um, and that different people's imprint actually, ha they, you have sharing permissions, privileges. So some people can share your files, some people can share your space. Um, and the way we looked at activating that was through this second skin, which could shift with the shifting um, elastic grid and would then form into work, work tables and um, seating arrangements and lounging, essentially the furniture scale. So um, you had this second layer of um, reconfigurable space and we had these different typologies. Uh, so more linear ones, more type, er, buildings that were more, areas of buildings that were more mixed and areas that were more um, compartmentalized, let's say. And then we looked at scenarios with The Sims, and we had people who were, you know, sleeping in one place, leaving, partying in Shoreditch, coming back, meeting with their friends, and always the space reconfiguring. Um, and I think that what I, and then of course we developed a site, um, and uh, this, the, the one building that we looked at was in Paddington over Paddington Basin. And there was another agenda which was not having this be a closed network, but on the ground floor, on the urban scale, having this open out to the city so that you could have, you know, these work professional network, you could have lecture series and you could have film screenings, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we developed it as a building. We had the dwelling cores. We had the open plan area, which was reconfigurable. Um, and it's like a, essentially a landscape of, of living. 
Um, and the idea really behind this was that this network could then extend. So it's not just four buildings in London, it's a whole network, it's a professional and social network that's an intranet, it's a technological network and it extends to all the other places where you have mobile uh, knowledge workers, so other cities, and if you go to New York, you could stay in one of these places, it would be part of your network. Um, I think some of this kind of thing is actually um, happening now. So you have places like WeWork, which are huge co-working collectives where they have shared lectures and I'm sure some shared media. Um, I think that a lot of these ideas still are relevant, um, but certainly the, I think the architectural solution may be less, um, I think the, the moving building less so, but the ideas behind it, uh, some of them have really come into practice. And this was before you had mobile um, internet con connectivity. So one of the things that happened while I was at the DRL is that Patrick, my thesis advisor, suggested from the way I was, the things I was interested in, he said, you know, you should really look at Social Logic of Space and Space is the Machine by Bill Hillier who's teaching at UCL. Um, he really connects um, use of space with, with, how, with people. Um, and I got very interested in space syntax. Um, so this is really great quote that space syntax, which is a, it's a lab at UCL and it's also a spin-off company, um, always puts forward, which is, this idea, house is a machine for living in, and then they had a student at UCL who said, but I thought all that functional stuff had been refuted, buildings aren't machines, and one of the space syntax um, professors said, you haven't understood, the building isn't the machine, space is the machine. Um, so a few years later, I started working at space syntax, um, and I'm sure many of you will know what space syntax is. It's a, quite a well-known methodology, and it's um, because of their master's program at the Bartlett, it is um, quite, there's a big community in London. This is a model of London which looks at the network, the root network, um, and it connects the geometry and layout of space with people's movement behavior in space. Um, so essentially people have certain behavioral traits, humans have behavioral traits which correlate um, on the aggregate about 70% with the layout of space. Um, so there's, a, there's an interrelationship between spatial structure which is how spaces are laid out geometrically and how different spaces li link to each other. Um, there's a connection between that and orientation, how humans perceive spaces and then where they choose to move through spaces. Um, I was fairly skeptical. I, I started working at Space Syntax. I was quite skeptical at the beginning about this theory and I didn't know if, I didn't know all the, um, the sort of the presuppositions that went into this model, I, I, I question them quite a bit. Um, it's not, it, 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 the model itself looks at topological connections of space and geometric connections of space. It creates an output and when that's observed against actual, actual observed movement, it correlates about 70%. So they don't know exactly why, but um, it's understood that it has to do with our cognition that we move along longest sight lines and we like to make fewest angular changes. So if you look at, this is the South Bank. Um, so we're looking here um, on the left-hand side, we have observed movement. That's a bunch of young people and students went out and, and actually stood for days on the street and counted people um, passing. And on the right-hand side, you have a computer model that's based only on the layout of the space. That means you put the plan and model the plan, um, and you run it through a computational model, which 
measures the distance from every root to every other root, but distance is calculated as um, percentage of angular change. And you essentially find that you can start forecasting um, movement. So at its most basic level, if you look at these two, um, if you think of this as two very simple plans, in this case, um, if we start from this room here, and this is our starting point, one step away is, this, is the room you have a door into, two steps away are the rooms you have doors into, three steps away are the rooms you have the subsequent rooms. If you start from another space the cent in the center, you have, do you have a step to four rooms and then another step to two and another step to three. If you justify those graphs, this is an example of a justified graph, um, this space here is very deep in the structure and this space is very shallow in the structure. Now, if you've designed a house, you know that this is probably something like a, a living room, a parlor. This is something like an ensuite bathroom. Um, that means this is more hidden in the network and this is more integrated in the network. You can think of it even like if you're clicking through folders on your desktop in your computer, this is a really hidden, you have to keep clicking in, 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 in to get to this space. This is much more high level. Um, that's easy to understand on the, the scale of, of a house, but on the scale of a city, um, it's much more difficult to predict. And so what these computer models do is they actually look at the topological connections of spaces and they analyze which are more integrated and which are more segregated, and that correlates with who will move on them. And the value of that is that um, you actually can predict to a certain degree of accuracy, leaving out the 30% that's for other types of attractions um, where you'll have footfall. And so developers are interested in that, cities are interested in that, and it doesn't mean that high footfall is good, it just means low footfall might be for exclusive uses or residential and high footfall might be Oxford Street. So um, it's a really interesting tool. Um, and I worked there for several years and I was really interested in learning about and trying to make the connection between um, human behavior. So on the left, this is Victoria Station. On the left-hand side, this is um, tracing people's path, tracing movement. Right-hand side, it's a computer model just based on the plan, and you can see there's a really similar trajectory of highest levels of movement. Um, same thing, this is a project um, we did at uh, Tate uh, Britain uh, to analyze the impacts of an extension. So this was prior to the extension. You can see this is observed movement of the main paths of use correlates really well with the space syntax model. And then what we did is we looked at what, what would the impact be of this series of connections. Um, and we then modeled that and that gives you, you can see there's a huge shift in kind of a major axis to the, let's say the east side of the plan. Um, so I found that really interesting working there and um, we worked on a number of really, really kind of interesting research projects and I wanted to get back into design um, so I started a company called Space Agency that was looking at, it was combining my design background with this idea of um, kind of user experience, essentially, with the human, the person at the center. Um, so if we look at user on this side and space on this side, um, essentially, looking at how people read spaces, how they perceive spaces, how they navigate through spaces. You have senses, user, the kind of nearest um, sense experiences, touch, hearing, sight, smell. Then out a level, your cognition, sense of direction, cultural meanings, et cetera. If you take, if you move to the opposite side, space, you have how a space, how legible a space is laid out, long sight lines, structured root network, landmarks, et cetera. Um, 
At the next level out, signs and coding, you have place naming, you have branding and identity, storytelling, signage, color coding, use of lighting. These are things we can add as a layer onto the environment which make it more intelligible and legible for people. Um, and now we have this new layer, which is on the space side, things like smart home devices and smart cities, which we hear a lot about now, live transportation information, responsive lighting. And on the user side, we have devices such as sat nav, smartphone, iWatch, et cetera. So these two things are, going back to my introduction, these two things are meeting in the middle. So Space Agency is an, um, a combination of all the meanings of space that we're so familiar with, outer space, you know, space for um, design, and also agency. And in its simplest meaning, we're a creative agency. And that's, I think that's the way most people interpret it. But going back to what I was saying before, my, my interest in the name, naming it Space Agency is also about the agency of space or the layout of space and how space influ how the layout and the um, how you organize space actually influences interaction. Um, so if space is the machine and the agent for human interactions, then what's lost when we navigate through these interactions without space? So what's lost when we exchange on Amazon and what's lost when we um, our socializing is through our smartphone. What is it? I think it's about embodied experience. I think it's about all the other senses, how we feel to be near other people, what the, the, the quality of the exchange we have when we're actually exchanging with other people. Um, so our practice covers a range of scales, and, um, but we approach space from a user experience perspective. This is a project in Dubai. Um, it's Dubai Expo 2020. It's the next big international uh, exposition after Milan. And we're working on the wayfinding um, and kind of visitor experience for, for this project. It's, um, this is a rendering. It's located in an area that's right now desert next to a new very large airport in Dubai. Um, it has a new metro station going to it from the Dubai Metro. It has a central node, which is called Al Wazel. And the importance of this central node is that Al Wazel is the old name for Dubai, which means the connection. So this is the connection point. Um, and then you have this kind of pinwheel of what they call souks, which each take a theme. So one is mobility, one is sustainability, and one is opportunity. And then you have these concourses Around it, you have all the international country pavilions and a concertina around that. Um, 430 hectares, huge project. So our first step was to look at the different user groups and how, which areas they would use. We ran a space syntax model to look at where we expected to find highest um, levels of pedestrian movement. Of course, because it's a centrally focused plan, a lot, you're gonna have a lot of pressure on the center of the plan. And then we started mapping um, these kind of touch points, um, which have different functions, and the number on them represents their functions. So some of them, our role is to provide a certain type of, let's say, welcome experience. Others, it might be signage, information, that you're at a junction, and this is what's this direction, and this is what's that's that direction. So. The numbers represent the hierarchy. The highest um, point in the hierarchy is al Wazel, the central node. And then we have these other wayfinding nodes. And so those we then put into a kind of tube map, um, which simplifies, the, um, simplifies our design into these types of nodes where we're providing information, wayfinding information, and also other types of experiential information. Um, and then what we would do often is kind of map out a scenario of someone moving through the space. These are always a little bit um, arbitrary, but in this case, what was interesting was that the client, we, we were also asked to influence behavior. So our role was not, is not just to develop wayfinding, but also to develop 
smart wayfinding, which is responsive in real time to um, to the user to the visitors who are there. Um, and one of the things we were asked, sorry. One of the things we were asked was to, um, they need to reduce the uh, number of visitors at night and ha well, they will have fewer visitors. They need to reduce the space that those visitors use at night and gather them all back to the center for what they call night expo. And they asked us, how can we achieve that? Um, we don't want to have people corralling them, pushing them to the center. What are some kind of subtle influences you can help us with to, to get people to move to a smaller area at the night, in the nighttime, so that there's still a sense of a buzz and a um, kind of vibrancy? Um, so we started trying to address that. We One of the things we looked at was um, this idea which came through in, in Dubai's bid for the expo, which they, they had this bid video and they said, in ancient, in, uh, in past times, we just had, you know, the sky, the desert, and the sea, the desert, and the sky, and now we had these three colors, and now we have all the colors. We have the, one of the largest deep water ports in the world, we're an international hub. We have a huge um, city, and we have a huge new airport, um, and we've really kind of increased in terms of our variety in our city. And so we took on that idea and we started looking at color coding these three petals of the, um, of the master plan. And because there was the shading structure there, we started to think about how that could be animated at night to lead people back toward the center. Um, and so we came up with this idea of in the sea coded zone, You'd have these waves leading you toward the center, kind of subliminally leading you toward the center. In the sky, you have the sky. Um, and in the desert, you have a sandstorm, which is a, which is a, a dynamic installation on the um, shading structure. Um, and we looked more into this idea of Dubai being the connection point, uh, especially because of the centrality of the al-wazal and the layout of the plan. Um, and furthermore, the, the kind of branding of the expo is based on this ring. Um, so Sheikh Mohammed, who's the leader of Dubai, um, liked the idea that the ring is a, is a kind of connect, a form of connection. And they have this artifact which they've found, and that artifact has led to their logo. So we took that on board and we started thinking about how the wayfinding manifestations and touch points could fit into that design language. And that's something we do on every project is we always try to build a design language that's in keeping with the rest of the project. But we wanted to rationalize it because um, we needed something that could become a system and ideally a modular system. And so we started laying this out on the grid and developed a family of forms um, and the, that family of forms still had the idea of a, connect, a connector. Um, and so we built that family of forms, or we are building that family of forms at the moment, we're in design development, um, into a series of different informational devices. And they can be signage, they can be static, they can have screens, they can be um, touch points, they can be immersive, and they all work with the same design language, which is, comes out of the, the kind of formal language that's already been established on the project. Um, these are interactive points, and some of them are static points. Um, and they, they serve a series of different uses, depending on that original tube map diagram, where they're located. Um, at the same time, there's an app being developed. We've been working on a user interface for the app. The app is not only destination locational based, um, but it also incorporates transport information, social, where's my family, where are my friends right now at the expo, um, the places, crowd dynamics, and um, events, because of course this is an event. 
So we worked with the same idea of a, something that's centrally focused. It's a dial. You have different um, kind of uh, notches on the dial for those five different um, types of information you might be looking for. And then this serves many different uses. It becomes a passport for which countries you visited. It um, allows you to zoom in to different events that are happening right now. Um, it's a heads-up map, which helps you find your way around. And because it's an app, it's, it's useful today on your mobile and on your tablet. They're also developing a wearable, although it'll probably be different from this, but um, it will be usable on a wearable. Um, it has transport information, and then also can be embedded into different environments, so both at the expo and in the city, importantly, you've got to find your way there as well. Um, and then this is just a kind of visualization of some sort of augmented reality use of this app. So um, this is another project we've been working on with OMA. It's a highway uh, in Qatar. It's a 179-kilometer highway. And it rings the metropolitan area of Doha. Doha is a single. Um, built up area in the country of Qatar. Um, so essentially, most of there are a few urbanized nodes, but they're really more towns than anything else. Um, and the, the, the idea with the highway is not only to provide a, a kind of strong connection outside of the city around the city, but also to cap urban sprawl. Um, so this is meant to be the final barrier that Doha can extend to. Um, and it's, the project is it's called Orbital Highway Artscape. Um, we were brought on board by OMA to look at wayfinding and also um, art to a certain extent, so the, the artscape. Um, and we started by looking at Doha as the center. Um, and we, we really felt that the, the artscape along the highway, rather than being something punctual, so at first there were, there were curators who were involved, um, and they were coming up with ideas to have an Anish Kapoor sculpture at Junction 11, and kind of very um, punctual moves, and the design team who were OMA, um, and then subconsultants ourselves, a landscape designer and a lighting designer, we all felt that this should be more of a kind of continuous experience as an artscape. Um, and so we started looking at it more as a choreography, um, something more like there are high points in the experience and low points in the experience, and maybe the art that we produced could, could reflect that in some way. Um, and so at the same time, there was a really interesting aspect about the spatial form of this hemisphere um, hemisphere road, which, which um, also needed to be branded and is the kind of final flagship project of the um, president of the Public Works Department. So he wanted it to be something really interesting, more than just a highway. Um, and so we worked on these ideas of, that have to do with um, basically with rhythm. And we, um, some of our first ideas are around um, actually having lighting that tracks, because it's quite a, it's not a very well used highway at this point, you have, it can be quite, um, quite quiet. So we thought it would be interesting if, if you have light, a kind of lighting installation which tracks drivers and you can see in a distance people also moving. Um, we then moved on from that. Let's see. Um, and started to look at Um, mapping, a, a mapping exercise to bring out the features of what's already there. So a lot of people, when they drive on this highway, it is in the desert. It is a very um, fairly remote, some of the areas are quite remote. Um, and you can have the 
sense of um, kind of monotony. So what we tried to do as a team, everyone, the landscape architects, lighting designers, um, and obviously Ome was to bring out the natural features and we started to map those and develop this rhythm that brought out the, um, the geological formations, the just the small things, a palm, there was like a palm nursery, a lake that had flamingos on it. And what we did is we developed that into this um, kind of graphic system which um, marks the journey. Um, so alongside the highway, there's also a cycle route. And the cycle route has cycle shelters. And um, together with the team, we came up with this kind of marking system to know how far you, along you are in the journey and to um, bring out, have interpretive um, panels which bring out the, um, the, the kind of features of the landscape, rather than adding an Anish Kapoor sculpture, just trying to find what's there culturally and naturally in terms of heritage. Um, and so this will give you an idea of, um, yeah, the development of the project. And this, again, a whole language was built around the different types of gateways and junctions, different coding of the junctions. Um, how they, you know, trying to establish a rhythm for people driving and also for people cycling. So again, it's a, it's a sort of layer of information um, that's added over, in this case, over a piece of infrastructure. It's a huge highway, um, and it's also part of it is a truck route. Um, but then alongside, you have these this cycle path and these cycle shelters, and you have this this kind of marking of the of the rhythm of the journey. Um, so we finished the concept design on that about, uh, I think it was in December, but we're waiting for the next stage. Um, So another project we've been working on is a cruise ship. Um, again, pushing the boundaries of architecture. There are a lot of other, we're working with a number of different interior designers and architects on this project. Um, and it's, uh, for, it's a confidential client, very big company, and they're looking to shake up the cruise industry. So they're targeting two very young demographics. One they're calling the cravers, and the other they're calling the curious class. And the cravers are meant to be kind of high-flying young 20-somethings uh, who are looking to party and to enjoy the good life. Um, and the curious class are meant to be in their 30s, and they're kind of post-backpacking, post-backpackers who want to do cool things and try new uh, different I don't know, uh, yoga and maybe see, kind of take an alternative um, path who wouldn't normally go on a cruise, but um, essentially they're trying to find ways to, to interest people like this in cruising. Um, we are working on wayfinding. We're also um, collaborating, so we're working on the user, the kind of physical user experience, and we're collaborating with a company on digital user experience. So we've looked at how circulation works in the ship, which is um, at the first level vertical. Um, we've mapped out destinations um, and how you get there essentially, both in um, vertically in the ship and also 
on one deck. So people tend to go to the public areas and then hang out from there. They get out of their cabin level, they go to a public floor and they kind of wander around this landscape of activities. Um, so we've mapped out the destinations, the hierarchy of destinations, and then started looking at how we can create this informational interface and what's the narrative behind it. So we looked at um, different aspects relating to seafaring, um, explored, this is a mind map, which we often do, explored all the different influences and, and kind of um, historical aspects from Morse code and um, Greenwich Mean Time to uh, Vikings and Moby Dick and, and just tried to categorize those essentially. Um, and what we came to uh, was that we wanted to look just purely at navigation um, and this idea of it being very straightforward. This, um, the globe was mapped through navigation and also at the same time having an element which is more um, kind of textural, which is this idea of ge the layers of an island. So we came up with a metaphor of a compass, but a very um, abstract compass, which is influenced by Morse code. One of the issues that people have on a ship, these are like floating cities, and one of the issues people have is they come out of the, the lift and they can't figure out which way is forward and which way is backward because they don't actually have any visibility to the sky and to the outside and everything looks the same. So when people come out of the lift, it's quite important that you give them these kind of primary directions. And so we appropriated the lighting um, as a means to do that so that, um, which I'll show you a bit later. We also were interested by some of this notation of um, that you see like the plimsoll line which measures um, how deep uh, a ship can get into different types of water. So plimsoll line is on every ship um, and it, it shows in summer water temperatures and winter water temperatures and saline, more like more saline um, seawater and more freshwater, how deep the boat can be loaded. Um, so we were inspired by that and we started using this, um, this kind of these notational systems within the wayfinding. So this is at lifts when you come out having a clear direction for aft, port, starboard, and learning that language. So we developed a language, and then we want people during the course of their week to learn that language. As they come out of the lift, then there's a bigger space where you can have actual plan and section information, as well as digital information. Um, and also using some of this narrative aspect of each level has, as you go deeper in the ship, you go further underwater. So um, you board on level six, which is kind of water level, and then on deck six, and then above that you're above the water, below that you're below the water line. So we wanted to emphasize that in the naming of the ship. So you kind of go down deeper into the depths uh, with the naming. Um, and then we also looked at the digital scheme, and as I've mentioned, we were, were working with a, a, a company who's developing the digital user experience. Um, and that includes things like social elements, so, um, you know, what's trending right now. It's a huge floating city. You can't see where people are, but you can find out if people, and this is a young, I mean, it's a 20 and 30-something kind of event, so it's a lot of immersive theater and concerts and... Um, you know, different types of wellness. Um, and so, yeah, looking at how we can um, communicate that to, you, to people and also develop, we developed this idea of a social radar. So it works with the same ideas of navigation and um, you can find your friends. Um, what's interesting is that we, in talking with the, the people developing the digital user experience, the, there are going to be sensors all over the ship, different types of sensors, you know, the Wi-Fi and um, all kinds of um, kind of uh, fencing, digital fencing, 
to understand where people are so everybody's located. Everybody gets a wearable when they um, board and there's an app which kind of, um, which uh, is part of your whole experience. So the interface that you use to, to book restaurants, to um, book excursions, to find people, et cetera. And what, the, what these guys have said is that they have, this is for them a unique experience because they, they have all the information on all the passengers. They know what everybody's eating, they know what everyone's buying, they know what everyone's clicking on. And it's very sophisticated. They have lean-in techniques where, um, you know, if somebody seems interested in something that's being offered up on screen, they know that that person will take at that moment. They have lean out uh, functionality where you kind of offer up wild cards to people of things they could do. So I think something to bear in mind is um, we're kind of sleepwalking into a world where all of our activity, all of this connectivity is actually being um, commodified. And that information that's being gathered is very easily sold on after you get off the ship. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I'm happy to be on the spatial side of things. I feel like we're fairly neutral. Everything that we do isn't per se collecting any information on people, but we're increasingly asked how we can influence, how our work can influence um, passengers, visitors, et cetera. This is a project also with OMA. Um, it's called Qatar Cultural and Sports Hub. It's a 740 hectare master plan in Doha also. Um, and it's a new piece of the city. It occupies the old airport because the new Doha International Airport has moved further east. Um, it occupies the old port because they built a new port. And um, it is programmed to be, uh, it has a World Cup venue, World Cup Stadium, and it w was programmed to be an Olympic, to, to host Olympic venues for, um, Qatar. this is Qatar's bid for the World Cup, I mean for the Olympics, this is prior to the kind of World Cup scandal that happened um, over the past year. So this is an Olympic-sized uh, rowing lake, and um, in order to get the water cool enough in Qatar for it to meet Olympic standards, uh, we were on a team where engineers were working to, to design a system to pump water in from five kilometers out in the Gulf. So you could get deep down, you could get cool enough water to bring it into the rowing lake so they could meet the Olympic standards and, and win an, um, an Olympic bid. And then that water then trickles back, back into the Gulf and irrigates what was called Sports Avenue. Um, so again, a huge mix of uses. There are five districts in this master plan. There's a people uh, mover system, which includes the extension of the gold line, um, metro, water taxis, um, a cable car, a shuttle bus system, et cetera. And we looked at how to map out those different um, transport networks and arrival to site via public transport, the sea, there's also a cruise port, um, the roads and pedestrian network, the types of modes of transport people would use, the stops they would stop at, and then finally alighting at the site which is all pedestrianized and moving through the site. And we um, were engaged to develop wayfinding and we came up with an idea of a ribbon of information which extends through the 740 hectares, but changes depending, changes its form to suit the five districts differently. Um, so again, looking at hierarchy of information, how you present information to people um, in a way that is most um, legible and to get the, the most important information first. We mapped out places for different types of wayfinding and signage. We then developed a language, kind of graphic language, um, which we had some research to do on into traditional Arabic versus modern standard Arabic, how we could lay that out in relation to Latin text. Um, and then we used that, the, the kind of font that we had chosen, the typeface we had chosen in Arabic, to create a, a, 
a library of pictograms, which would represent the various activities on site. Color is then representative of each different mode of transport. Each of the five um, districts have a different pattern, which is all on a hexagonal grid. Um, we looked at transport signage, again, colored, very functional signage, um, using these pictograms colored by the mode of transport, and then developed pedestrian signage, which, which was kind of inspired by the amusement park um, and this idea of a ribbon. So the ribbon takes different form in different areas and has different heights to suit different distances that it needs to be read from or if, if there's some sort of ergonomic relationship like a touch screen. Um, and then kind of rolled out a family of typologies, including a, a digital aspect as well. Um, so this is another project, it's Pan American Highway. This is a project we did for pamphlet architecture, which are, it's a publication by Princeton University Press. It was an invited competition. Um, really kind of really nice um, opportunity. And we, uh, I did this with a, a colleague and we, um, we could choose our topic. And we, we wanted, we were very interested in the Pan American Highway, which is according to Guinness Book of World's Records, the longest um, motorable highway in the world. It extends from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, 70 degrees north, to Tierra del Fuego at 54 degrees south. And um, it's known as the Pan American Highway in many parts of Latin America, or the Inter-American Highway. As it moves through the United States, it takes on different names and is less well known. Um, and we were interested in this aspect. It, it was, the idea emerged out of an international congress in the 1920s with this kind of um, idealistic idea about connecting the Americas, the, the dream of the Pan-American Pan um, collect, collective or unity. Um, and so we thought it would be really interesting to look at the highway. The bottom here is the section of the highway, so that's, the whole, we mapped out the whole section, but because it's 30,000 kilometers long, we had to actually exaggerate it so you could see any of the mountains, the Andes or the Rockies on here. Um, and we came up with this identity, which is a highway marker about north-south. So the whole project basically takes a hinge point at Panama Canal and folds the Americas over on each other. Um, and then looks at how the highway can have markers along it, um, which connect north and south. So when you get to 19 degrees, in the north you're in Oaxaca, in the south you're in Cuya. Um, and the idea was to plant these seeds one day's journey apart. So because it's a highway, it's one car journey apart. It's about 500, each of these markers is 500 miles apart. and. The aspect about them that's a given is that they always mark um, the, the latitude. And then they tell you what's at that latitude. So here we're at truth or consequences uh, in New Mexico, 33 degrees north, but in the south you would be in Santiago, Chile. So it's, con it's creating a, um, an imaginal connection or a, um, a kind of awareness um, between North America and South America. And the idea behind these is that they could then, you know, um, be go out to a, uh, like a competition and could be localized. They could be for provision of information. They could be, um, you know, they could serve different uses, an art installation. But essentially, it's just this highway, highway marker, which is giving you this information connecting, connecting the highway together. Um, and the form is based on, it's called a tombo, and it's based on, um, on the Inca Trail, one horse, day's horse ride apart are a series of inns, which would be a place you would stay overnight. So, um, so this is our motor, motor tombo. Um, and in our, visualization, in our visualization, it takes on, this is Alaska, takes on some kind of aspect of, of the local place. But, we didn't think that 
to pursue this project, we didn't think we would develop all of these more, that it would be something that could be um, kind of taken on by other people. One of my last projects is a project I worked on with Tyen. This is Tyen's um, baby, I would say, uh, at Zaha Hadid Architects. And it's in New Cairo, which is on the road between the Cairo airport and the downtown. Um, beautiful, beautiful design. By the time we came on, they were already in design development. And um, what is fascinating about this site is that um, it's in a petrified forest. It's land, as far as I understand, that had been, um, reser had been uh, reserved and was then released to development. And it's part of a bigger development called Stone Park. And in Stone Park is the stone. And the stone is actually a petrified um, tree that is there from the time when Egypt was a savanna. So, so our interpretation is that these stone towers are like stone trees. And our role was to develop wayfinding and signage. And we wanted to elaborate on the concept that had already been developed by the team. And um, so we took on this idea, which we felt was very strong in it already, of geology and also kind of tree forms. And um, looked at coding the different areas of the master plan through metals. So gold, silver, bronze, uh, copper, bronze, electrum, which is an alloy that which is kind of historically known in Egypt, um, which have in, in kind of ancient Egyptian cosmology all have meaning. So we thought that would be interesting. And then took on this idea that the, the buildings were trees. And then as you move down, the landscape could be ground cover and drop into the basement as roots. So there were 18 or close to 18 office buildings, a five-star hotel, public space, retail space, parking, parking underneath, um, a sloping site. And most people, because of, um, because of security risks and um, these days, uh, most people, the, the site was sort of secured at the perimeter. So rather than being an urbanistic development, very much a, almost like a gated community, and people would arrive into the parking lot and that into the car park underneath. And that meant that the car park became a kind of lobby for the project. So it was um, Tayen's team's intention that people should pop up from the car park into the public space, not into their building, because that would run the risk of people going into their building, going back down, going home, and not really populating the public space. And there was a strong intention to activate the public space. Um, we looked at the geometries of the project um, and the, the kind of well-known um, geometries in their offices work and started building a matrix from 90 degrees to 45 and from a perfect corner to a, a much more filleted corner and created this matrix of forms. And again, this is building a design language. And then um, amalgamated those forms into a kind of graphic language, which we felt had something to do with, um, with the history of um, hieroglyphics. And then that began to populate the master plan. So in the car park, underground, where normally it would be very dull, we, um, we populated the long ramps down with these graphics, uh, graphics of kind of acceleration. We, used, we proposed to use color um, to lead people, a gradient of color to lead people toward these vertical access points up to the main plan, a uh, main um, kind of public space. The public space itself, this is a mapping of, of um, kind of decision points. Public space itself was um, very hard to see across. So there was a strong desire to have people staying at night and going out to dinner and, and activating that space. But there was a real risk that wouldn't happen. And from the space syntax background, if you don't have long direct sight lines, and you can't see across spaces, um, you might need 
some more kind of impetus to, to keep people to understand that as one space. So we looked at this idea that there was the risk that people would just come out in that space, go to one of their office buildings that that, that um, vertical connection point was uh, accessing and go home. And what we really wanted to do was to connect that long spine of movement and make a place in the middle of stone towers. And so we started looking at, to begin with, the formal language of the landscape. Um, and we applied the gold, silver, bronze, et cetera, color coding, and then started looking at a form of signage which was completely integrated with the landscape. Um, and I think that's something that's really important is we're, we're working between graphic design and architecture, but we're working in an architectural way in that we, we believe in the space being integrated um, and not having kind of additive elements. So you see here, each of these lines leads between one of the vertical connection points and a building, and it has information in it at these junctions, and then is an illuminated band, which at night close, and during the day just gives you a kind of pointer in the direction you're headed in this very complex landscape, which is a, um, a beautiful uh, kind of very complex master plan. And then once we got to the buildings, Again, these are the trees. Each of the buildings had two wings and a central atrium. And we wanted to represent that spatial structure to make it visible for visitors. So we looked at this idea of trees. We tried different forms of trees and essentially came up with a, a quite a um, rationalized tree, which is either A wing or B wing and is a tenant directory and, and again is um, identified by the, the color, the, the um, type of metal that you would expect there. Um, I think this is the last project. This is a project in Kazakhstan. Uh, it's Expo 2017. It will be finished next summer. And it's a huge master plan. It has an eight-story museum at the center. Um, the master plan was designed by uh, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill. And um, Kazakhstan is an oil-rich country, and the theme of their expo is future energy. And this is the Museum of Future Energy. And then around it, you have um, thematic pavilions and then country pavilions. So it's a very geometrically um, kind of uh, formal arrangement. Um, so again, the museum in the center, the country pavilions around the edge, and other types of uh, commercial and food and beverage in the middle. There's a conference hall, a hotel, etc. cetera. Um, we looked, being inspired by the geometry of the master plan, we wanted to elaborate that on that. And we looked at um, sacred geometry. So this idea of the circle, how the circle's been used in architecture, um, especially because there were four sub-themes, air, fire, water, and earth. We, um, we started looking at alchemy and how different symbols, these sacred geometries in alchemy were represented. And we came upon a really um, kind of basic shape language um, to represent the different areas of air, fire, water, and earth. But again, because it's energy, it needed to have something kind of dynamic and future-oriented. We also looked at coloring, air, earth, water, and fire, um, and then developed a graphic language which um, designated each of the zones, fire, earth, water, wind, air, and those then got applied to the master plan, so color coding, um, and, and then we looked at, of course, mapping the spaces, how they connect, what are the different um, organizational connections between spaces where we might need to provide information, both digital and physical information, and kind of radii of, um, of distance around each of those information points, then mapping out the actual information that we would need on each of the, at each of these points um, in detail, kind of pre-design, and then looked at um, a series of forms which spliced the sphere. So we took the central sphere and looked at ways to splice it and then came up with both digital and physical touch points. So this is a digital um, user interface for a map. Um, other ones are static and give you directories about the, the space. 
Um, we also looked at the sphere and visitor flow through the sphere and ran a space syntax analysis on it um, and provided information to the client on which areas might become congested and how we could use wayfinding to alleviate that congestion. Um, and then kind of identifying, this is inside the sphere now, identifying different levels um, and creating, there's a projector inside the lift which, which as you move through the Museum of Future Energy inside the sphere, you move through the different elements and so you can see that um, kind of changing on the projection. So that's it, that's um, just a selection of the kind of current work we're doing and um, I think gives you an idea of a different way of looking at um, architecture. Hi. Um, so we'll open up the floor to some questions, but maybe I'll just kind of throw something out quickly in terms of um, the kind of scale that you're looking at and operating at. Um, I mean, I haven't seen some of the work in a long time, and so it's quite interesting to see the scale getting, in some ways, even bigger. Um, and what your kind of feeling about that is, like, is it? Do you feel that it's getting bigger in terms of the scale and? What are, what are the challenges, maybe? I think um, what's unusual about our practice is we're both looking at a very, very large scale urbanistically, um, and we're looking at a very small scale because the actual physical design is product design and graphic design mostly. And we have a lot of embedded, you know, embedded work into interiors or landscapes, but really that's a, that's a small scale design. So we're kind of at the very large end of the spectrum in terms of our organizational thinking, our spatial thinking, and then at the very small, well, moderately small end in terms of fabrication and construction. And um, yeah, I think working large scale is very appealing. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll open up to some questions. Uh, Frederick. Hi, thank you for Thanks. the uh, very interesting lecture. <clears throat> I wanted to follow up Tyne's questions about the scale, and I do see the point that even if the projects are huge, they have a smaller scale because you have things that you interact with on a very direct level. But um, one could perhaps see the scale more as in thinking about the way the space syntax works. And in these projects that you show, that perhaps it's just a selection, but it is in a way tackling masses of people, even if, if you, I mean, the way that these signs are designed is are to address not just that one person, but hundreds of thousands. And maybe that's the way of scale thinking. So to follow up, follow up question, perhaps, have you worked on or, or are you also working on ways where the experience is more tailored not just through like that the technology would recognize you but like it, it's a restaurant mm -hmm. a small or even someone's house yeah. or or something like that that is permanently unique to a smaller scale or less amount of people we do yes so i've shown a selection of very um kind of consistent and large projects. We work, we're working on a hotel right now. We've worked on a lot of restaurants, um, actually, and even smaller kind of cafes. Um, uh, I think that somehow the large scale um, is, I don't know, I, I, we do both. We're going to work on Clark and Well Design Week and do the wayfinding for that, which is small to medium scale. Um, I think the large ones really, you really tackle the issues of um, kind of urbanistic issues. And then the small scale, uh, it's much more about d design and craft and um, kind of tailoring the experience to a particular client's brief. Yeah. 
Sarah, thank you for a fascinating evening. <coughs> a lot of work. But you did mention at the beginning the notion of shared experience and mm. how you recall um, experiencing possibly a piece of television or experiencing a film or experiencing a, an event and that experience being shared culturally, mm. okay? Mm. And obviously, I acknowledge that and the fact that in the last 15 years that shared experience because of time shifting doesn't take place. And yet, the one thing I think links all of your projects is creating the notion of a shared experience. Mm. Whether you're on a boat, on the road, driving, Panamera and Hub, in an expo, mm. Mm. Yeah, the, in a way, are you actually, in a funny sort of a way, trying to stop the fragmentation of a non-shared experience? Because I get the feeling that what worries you about the way culture is going is the notion of isolation and the lack of community because of the lack of shared experience. So I'll just throw that out. I, I think that's 100% right, and thank you for bringing up that point. That's, that's absolutely, and it, it is the reason why I moved away from the early days in the tech world, even though it was super interesting, and I'm absolutely excited about the future, and anybody who's a designer and an architect wants to and build the future. For me, I really believe in uh, being co-present in, in real space with real people. Um, and it's not that all this stuff, it's not that I don't use all the technology, it's just the extent to which we're atomized. Um, and even it seems now, I think the worrying aspect now is that even what we're seeing through our devices may be filtered just for us. So we're kind of even more in our own bubble and I really, I really, yeah, appreciate, I mean, I, the, the Expo was, a, the Expo Dubai was a fantastic project because I thought back to these ideas of this kind of world collective. Um, it's very idealistic, but the idea that people would come together and talk about the future collectively. I have sort of a, a, a question based on the opposite side of a collective experience which is that, say, on the boat, um, your information is being collected, mm. and the issue of privacy, say, um, and, and how erasable that footprint is, because, um, as we've seen with these email scandals, nothing's ever private um, anymore. So if you have your location known, and you're with somebody at a certain time, it's not like a piece of news, like I, or she, he said, she said, it said, oh, those two people were together in this location at this time. Almost like you could, you know, figure out who, who robbed what, or who, you know, was in a bedroom together, or, you know, things that you wouldn't want people to know. And, and um, you know, even on our mobile phones that our, our location is tracked, that we can track people all the time. Um, it's an interesting thing because it's it's data that is collected and then used for a personal experience to be with other people, so a one-on-one -on -one experience. But then that that what happens to that information once it's collected, and and um, I suppose spatially that might not have a huge implication, but it also does. And so I guess we we're relying on all this collection. I don't know if there's a way to like trash it or <laughs> get rid of it or anything. No one wants to trash it who's on the other side. Um, I think it's really interesting. So I put up that slide about the World Economic Forum. They've just opened a, um, a center in San Francisco because it is where all the tech people are, um, a, which is focused on the fourth industrial revolution. The idea behind that is that we need to be careful, we're moving, we really are moving into AI, we really are moving into robotics, we really are moving into driverless cars and um, genome uh, modification, g gene genetic modification. And the idea for the center, which is, you know, sponsored by global thought leaders, is that we 
actively, actively, all of us who are responsible need to um, be aware and try to steer the direction things are going. Because if it's just driven by the profit motive and by technological progress, we actually are, we need to think about which direction we're going. We are just being tracked and our data, our private data is just being sold and you know, um, it's time to realize, I think, that that's what's happening. I just wanted to actually, it fits in quite well, um, because I wanted to just go back to the beginning, actually, when you talked about um, uh, basically how the physical space, let's say, is being challenged by, by, dig by, dig by dig digital space, how the physical space is being challenged by digital space, and um, how the digital space actually becomes more important than the physical space. And actually, I think, Maybe it got lost a little bit, but I think it's quite a, quite a dramatic um, kind of seismic shift almost of what's going on. Um, and actually, I think we all, pretty much, apart from some kind of people who don't want to, uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, whatever. Um, I mean, we in, in in like the vast majority of people is very, it seems, is very happy to basically throw overboard like. 4,000 years of architecture and urban design um, just to pick up new technology that only has been around for like 10 years or, or 15 or 20 years or so. Um, and yet, we don't really understand what it means, meaning like there's no kind of theory about it really, there's no kind of manifesto of what it means. Um, so I'm, yeah, I was kind of wondering of just as a thing to think about and what your reactions or what your kind of views on that could be. I mean, I think the, the image of the, um, the Berlin Wall versus like the, um, the, the uh, antivirus thing is quite telling that the physical border is less important than the digital border, kind of. Um, and that's already 10 years ago, and of course it's just kind of moving on. Um, <laughs> 4,000 years of architecture. Um, I think, I mean, just to try to address that in some way, I think that, well, I feel that when I talk, when I go home and talk with people who are in the tech industry, um, go back to where I'm from, I feel irrele irrelevant. If I say I'm an architect, I feel often, this just seems like an irrelevant job to them, and like, oh, what do you, do you design building? Okay, well, no. Um, <laughs> and, and we are designers, uh, and uh, there is a lot of design taking place. I guess that's the point. There is a lot of design, there's a huge amount of design taking place right now, you know. STEM, the STEM subjects are being promoted. Somehow I feel like archi the architectural profession isn't, maybe in terms of fabrication, but in terms of actual use of space program, organization of space, um, kind of creating the spaces for social interaction, I feel like we're not engaging as much with where society is going. We're kind of engaging with technology on how to build buildings, but not so much how to, how to organize people and be relevant in that discussion. Oh, well, we're actually gonna, <laughs> we're gonna cut you off. Now, um, we do have um, some drinks, actually, so we can carry on the conversation. Um, but please, uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Sarah. It was a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.